don't think it was that big. Although Shoemaker Levy, yes. Carolyn's own, own comment, the largest piece was thought to be only a kilometer, the largest piece. So at 30 degrees, if Shoemaker Levy had hit this planet, it would have not poked a hole through the ice sheet at 30 degrees or less. If you get 90, then it's a different story. And this is well known, this is not our information, it comes from uh, Jay Maloche at the University of Arizona. There are a lot of calculations about what it takes to create a certain size crater. And this is right from their calculations. That, that angle and that size, those are small. Okay, I'll, I'll respond. Alan said some things that are correct and some things that are incorrect. Um, <laughs> um, let's start with the incorrect things. One is that not all impact angles uh, happen with the same probability. The most probability, most probable impact angle is 45 degrees. Uh, as you go to the vertical, it becomes less probable. As you go to the real grazing impact, it becomes less probable. So now we have a probable, a probability argument. So, so now I have to add another, you know, factor of 10 or something. If it, you know, it's, it's already improbably large, it's improbably broken, it's improbably a comet, and now it's coming in at an improbable. <laughs> it's, it's more like five bases. <laughs> Um, the part about low angle impacts being less likely to actually hit the ground and make a crater, that's true. Um, and the part about Shoemaker, the largest fragment of Shoemaker leaving nine, that's still debatable. My co-author, David Crawford, estimated that the largest fragments were about a kilometer. But a one kilometer object coming into Earth's atmosphere at 30 degrees will definitely hit the ground and make a crater. If it comes in, you know, at an ex extremely low grazing angle of a few degrees, then it goes through so much atmosphere that it burns up and only the last bits hit the ground. You'll still have a, a major effect on, <coughs> excuse me, a major effect on the ground. So again, I think we've gotten to an extremely improbable situation. <laughs> 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 One more question. Yes. Uh, yeah, your panel of contras is great, but uh, no offense, they're all physical scientists. What we haven't heard this morning is uh, contradiction or support from the biological and ecological side, and I can think of mega questions and uh, micro uh, questions there. Uh, why are the uh, terrestrial megafauna selectively wiped out? And the other is, on the micro scale, ultimately, uh, what species or genera of algae are involved in these mats? What is their geographic distribution? Is it all the way from Catalina to Europe? Uh, what's going on there? Okay, the first part on the size is that um, one, part, one problem with the, the geologic record, paleontological record, is that small bones just don't survive like big bones. So it's, so it's skewed towards the bigger animals in the first place. It's almost impossible to find bird bones, even though birds were far more common than mammoths. There are probably a lot more mammoths found than there are small birds. So part of it is a matter of it just didn't exist, it didn't survive the record. But the other thing is that we think that the fire was the biggest problem with this event, that it, we have massive evidence of fire at every land-based site that we looked at. So if this thing uh, set fire to grass and trees, then most of the animals wouldn't have had much to eat. We doubt whether the impact itself killed most of the animals. We think probably starvation did. And Vance Haynes has an interesting idea. He finds evidence for of freezing of the lakes in the San Pedro Valley in southern Arizona, and, and his hypothesis is that without water, most of these animals could have survived only a few days. Without food, they could have gone longer, but water would have been crucial. And so whether that's true or not, I don't know, but at any rate, it seems to be the grazers were the ones that were most in danger. They needed the most food, the most water, and those might have been in short supply. The generalists, including people who, who were pretty much omnivores were in the better, best shape. They could eat anything, including all the dead megafauna, at least for a while. So, uh, so uh, it, it's a little harder to say, but the grazers were the ones that re really went out, and then the animals that fed on the grazers were in trouble, too. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. I especially want to thank our panel for coming today. Um, Thank you.
I hope what you've heard today gives you a sense of what this debate is about. The stakes are very, very high. The, the issues are very, very important. I hope you continue to follow this, um, this uh, developing scientific debate as it goes on because it's uh, of extreme interest and importance uh, to North American archaeology. Thanks again, everybody.